Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Blue Code Talks for today. We are super excited to be able to sit down with Dr. Pascal Roy-Léveillé, who is a permafrost scientist and an associate professor of geography at Laurentian University. She's also a member of Living with Lakes Research Center and the Memoising Indigenous Research Institute of the University. The really fun fact about Dr. Pascal Roy-Levy is she is the only female permafrost scientist in Canada to hold a faculty position. So we're really looking forward to speaking with her today about and learning more about permafrost and permafrost research in Canada. So I'm welcoming Pascal to the call today. Hi, Pascal. Hi, Jennifer. It's nice to be here. Well, thank you for joining us and talking to us a little bit more about uh, permafrost. I know um, just even looking outside, the frost seems to be really leaving our soil, but bring the question, what's the difference between the frost that we see here in Sudbury and permafrost? Yeah, when we're talking about permafrost, we're talking about frost that is in the ground permanently. So unlike the one we see around Sudbury that thaws every summer. So every, every winter our ground freezes in, in this area where we live, but then uh, when the warm temperature come in the summer, the ground thaws again. You know, in areas where there is permafrost, the surface of the ground is going to thaw during the summer, but it's not warm enough during the summer to compensate for how cold it was in the winter. So the top of the ground thaws, but there's some frozen ground that remains beneath, and that's what we call the permafrost. It's the part that's going to stay frozen all year round. Strictly speaking, it has to stay frozen for at least two years. But in, in the kind of places where it's cold enough to have permafrost ground that stays frozen through the whole summer and through the whole year, generally over time, year after year and after year, this layer of frozen ground is going to build up and thicken into the ground. And that's what we talk about when we're talking about permafrost. Okay, so that's a good point of reference. The other thing is I've been reading a lot where they're referencing either permafrost is melting or permafrost is thawing. And I'm hearing you use thawing. What would be the difference and why those different terms? What's the right term to use? I know often people say, you know, the permafrost is melting because when people think of frost, they think of ice. But of course, yeah. when we're talking about permafrost, as I just said, it's ground that is frozen. So there is a lot of ice in the ground and that's part of why we're so concerned about it thawing but it also has sand and it has some dead leaves and it has some rocks in it. And so it's a little bit more like a lasagna. That's why we say it thaws rather than it melts. You know, for the ground to melt, all these rocks would have to go in fusion and turn into lava. That, that's not what's happening. It's just the water component, the ice that's in the ground that thaws. So the ground goes from similar to a frozen lasagna to a thawed lasagna that has uh, stayed out on the counter top for <laughs> I love that analogy of that frozen lasagna. That's a perfect example for this. Now, when we're looking at the permafrost, and I guess the, uh, the, the soil and uh, the land that has permafrost, how much of it are we considered, uh, is considered permafrost even here in Canada? Yeah, there's quite a bit of it. Actually, I, I have a photo for you, a map. Uh, it's the first slide that I have. It's, it's a map of Canada. And it shows us the extent of the areas that are affected by permafrost. So I don't know if we'll be able to bring um, that first slide on. Okay, we'll see. When, uh, there we go. So it's coming up right here. Perfect. Okay. So uh, here you go. We'll, we'll go back to the photos in a second. So here you can see a map of Canada and there's different shades in there. So there's a darker blue near the top. Those are areas that we call or that are underlain by continuous permafrost. It means there's permafrost almost everywhere. 90% of the ground will have that layer of frozen ground beneath it. So only where there's lakes and rivers do we find sort of bulbs of unfrozen ground that break up the permafrost in there. But as we go further and further south towards the lighter blue and the turquoise, type colors, then we're going to more, you know, discontinuous sporadic permafrost and in the southernmost areas with permafrost, you just get a patch of it once in a while in areas where it has subsisted from, it's still there because of past cold conditions or very special conditions in that one place that make it colder. So the further north we go, the more permafrost we have, it's almost everywhere. And the further south we go, the more patchy it is. But all of that together, these areas where you might, you have to deal or think of permafrost if you want to build something, 
that represents about half of the Canadian landmass. And you know, you know, while I'm on that topic, people sometimes think that nobody lives there, but there's a lot of people who live there actually. So we have cities in the permafrost zones of Canada that have tens of thousands of people in them like White Horse and Yellowknife and lots of people also in Inuvik and Iqaluit, thousands of people. So there's, there's a number of cities, about a hundred, like over a hundred thousand people living in large cities and also in smaller communities. But there's also industries operating up north and a lot of indigenous people who travel these territories, even where there's no roads and no infrastructure for hunting, for gathering berries, for just traditional activities. So yeah. it's not as densely populated as Toronto, but it still is a busy place where uh, that is important to a lot of Canadians and to us in many ways. And, and I'm assuming that the people living up in those areas, um, they're probably the ones that know even more than some of the researchers, the changes that have happened with all of this uh, thawing permafrost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's one of the things I like most um, in my work, in my research work. So, you know, I'm interested in I'm interested in in lakes and ponds and how they interact with permafrost. That's where I've done a lot of my work. But I'm interested in understanding what makes certain kinds of environment more sensitive to thawing. Right? Some places are thawing faster and more catastrophically than other places. And I like to work. I really like to work with people. So I work with other scientists who are interested in, in what I'm producing, you know, because for different reasons, but really the people who are living and working on permafrost terrain and in these permafrost landscapes, they're really at the front line. So they're the ones who see the changes first and who best understand the meanings and the implications at the local and regional scale. The animals are not coming in this area anymore. The land has changed or it's wetter over here or, you know, like those kinds of changes. It, it's amazing what you can learn when you work in close collaboration with the people who, who are traveling these areas. And, and clearly I want my research to be useful to those people as well. So I'm always happy to, to work with them. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about your research and what are you searching for and what's your passion with permafrost? So I mentioned earlier that um, permafrost is a little bit like a lasagna because it contains a lot of water. Permafrost contains quite a bit of ice. So maybe before I tell you about my research, I need to tell you a little bit more about why people care about permafrost or why we're so worried about it thawing. Then I'll make it Sounds easier good. to understand what I do. So there's two, I guess, two key drivers um, that make us, that drive permafrost research. The two reasons why we're pretty worried about permafrost thawing. Okay. Um, one of them is that we can't eat it. It's not, it's like a lasagna, but it's not even edible. <laughs> so, so the problem indeed is what's in the permafrost. It's not made of noodles and spaghetti sauce. It contains, first of all, a lot of carbon. So let's talk about that first, because I think people who've heard about permafrost before have heard sometimes that when permafrost thaw, there can be greenhouse gases coming out of there. So that's one of our big concerns. So I, I think I have another slide. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the number so that it's easier to bring it up. So slide number four here shows a little bit more, uh, shows a little bit of information about um, the carbon that is stored in frozen ground. Here we are. <laughs> uh, there we I'm not going in the right order for my slides, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of carbon in permafrost here. I wrote like 1,400 billion tons of carbon that's in, in those permafrost areas in the soil. So some of it is in the layer close to the surface that freezes and thaws each year. And some of it is frozen in the ground. So there's, when I say carbon in the ground, I mean dead plants, it could be dead animals too, but in large part, it's dead plant material that has sort of fallen off onto the ground and built up over time. But because we have permafrost in those areas, that plant material found itself frozen in the ground before it decomposed and rotted. So it kept it from, because, it, because that uh, organic material or that plant material wasn't able to rot and stayed in the freezer, if you will, in the permafrost freezer, it never got to decompose and emit. So when things rot, they emit greenhouse gases, I guess is the, the key component here. So microbial activity, 
you know, even a banana peel that rots and then the microbes sort of help decompose it. And there's greenhouse gases that come out like carbon dioxide and methane. And, and this, so is one of, yeah. this is one of your colleagues with the, uh, the methane gas. Yes, methane <laughs> methane. One, of, one of the famous pictures from Katie Walter Anthony. So sometimes when permafrost, you know, when all that organic material decomposes, usually it happens gradually, but with permafrost, now we stored all that in the frozen ground and now it's starting to thaw. So we're worried that we're gonna get a big poof, amount of, of greenhouse gases coming out as all of this starts rotting. And sometimes it's just CO2, carbon dioxide that comes out, but sometimes, especially if it's a really wet area and it's rotting underwater, then we get methane coming out. So that's what you're seeing here, Kelt Katie Walter Anthony, one of my colleagues who was um, at the time at the University of Fairbanks, started realizing that when you know, organic material was rotting at the bottom of lakes and ponds, which often form when permafrost thaws, you had all this methane coming out and it was accumulating under the ice here. So she would go around and poke a hole in the ice and then another person would like set it on fire. And so they, so we have this spectacular illustration of the fact that, you know, a lot of greenhouse gases can come out in conditions where, where permafrost is thawing. So that's one reason why we're very worried about permafrost thawing. And then the other reason, so this affects everybody all around the globe because it contributes to greenhouse gases and to the, the carbon budget globally. And then the other key reason why we're worried about permafrost thawing is because of how much ice it contains. And then we'll we'll switch to a different slide. So slide number five, which is- the yes. Before we switch to that, um, yeah. I have a question for you. Um, <laughs> The the 1,400 billion tons of uh, carbon emission, how would that compare to a car? How would it compare to what a car produces or to the size yeah, of a for, car? For a car or a vehicle that would produce, so uh, all of us driving around, is, do you have a comparison? No, I don't have a comparison for an individual car. That would be a nice calculation to make, but I can tell you that there's more permafrost and there's more carbon in the ground in these areas than we have in the whole atmosphere at the time. Wow. So okay. everything, everything included. Yeah. So, but you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to freak everybody out here. It is a little <laughs> bit scary. And that's why there's a lot of research going on to try and understand what will happen when the permafrost thaws. But you know, when you thaw, dead plant material that was frozen in the ground, all the carbon that's in there doesn't just jump into the sky, right? Like there's microbial activity taking place and digesting the plants and, you know, some of it might just stay there and some of the carbon comes out, some comes out as carbon or methane. So, so there's different potency in terms of the greenhouse effect. Okay. So there's a lot. So this represents a lot, a lot of carbon. <laughs> this represents <laughs> a huge amount of carbon. It's more than what you have in the entire atmosphere, but then um, it's not because it thaws that it'll jump straight into the sky, it happens progressively, it's mediated by microbial activity, and there is lots of people around the world really working hard to understand how permafrost thawing contributes to the carbon budget. So a lot of people may think that this is scary when they're, they're starting to hear yeah. that there's that much permafrost. So how are researchers working collaboratively together to try to, to come up with creative solutions or um, um, what will this research help to contribute? The research on the carbon component specifically? Carbon component, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, when we make those global climate model predictions, yeah. at the moment, we're not really able to integrate in those predictions the whole feedbacks, like the carbon that might come out of permafrost when it's thawing. Those models are so complex and they have so much to deal with in terms of plant up uptakes and interactions with the oceans and, and everything. And we haven't made it to a point where we're able to represent subsurface processes in those climate models, like the, the upper layers of the ground and what's happening there and what's thawing there and what's coming out. So we're still, you know, we've made some progress in recent years because everybody's trying to, a lot of people are trying to contribute to better understand like what's happening to this carbon. Does it come out when it's flying? And then how can we represent that in, uh, in the global climate model so that when we make predictions and we say, okay, we should limit global warming to about one or two Celsius degrees. We've also taken that 
into account. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you know what, Jennifer, <laughs> this is super important and there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. So if there's some people listening who want to become a permafrost scientist to come and help us out, they'll be most welcome because there's lots of work to do on that front. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I've had the opportunity to, to work with you and talk with you as we've been developing our Under the Arctic exhibit at Dynamic Earth. And uh, one of the things that has shined through is your absolute passion and devotion to the field of permafrost research. Um, <laughs> it has been an incredible pleasure to be able to learn more from you about this. And one of the big pieces that I've been able to take away from that is the collaboration between the various researchers, the various institutes, everybody is committed um, um, to working together. Some of the stories yeah. that you've told me about uh, um, working with engineers and infrastructure people, as well as the community members, have just resonated so strongly uh, with me. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, to say a little bit more, so to say a little bit more about that and to link into the second reason why people study permafrost is, is that so the carbon questions have become very pressing and, and very scary to a lot of people because it's it's a very it's a significant amount of carbon in the ground and we're not sure what's going to happen to it or what's happening to it as it thaws. So there's been people around the world really from everywhere starting to be interested in permafrost, even people from places where there's no permafrost. And then um, when permafrost thaws, it doesn't just create greenhouse gas emission, it has very concrete impacts for the people who are living there and who have built their houses on it and who rely on roads that are built on it. And so what started happening is that, um, you know, scientists would come up north and then they would do a study. They, you know, you always do a consultation in the community and say, I'm coming to work in your traditional territory or close to your home. And then you report your results. So people would say, well, there's this much carbon stored in the permafrost in this area. And people would be like, yeah, but my house is falling in a muddy hole. What are you doing to help me? And, and you know, yeah. I think rightfully so, you know, particularly I've heard this from Canadians who, who live in, in permafrost areas, but they would say, you know, all of those big questions are important, but us as Canadians, we're living on permafrost and we need to adapt to these changes and we need to prepare for these changes. What's the research community doing for us? And it became, it really came to the forefront, I think, of the Canadian research agenda recently. So when permafrost research started in North America, at first it was all about houses and roads, but then as the carbon questions came up, they sort of became prominent. And in the last couple of years, we got funding from the federal government, $5.5 million just very recently, so that we all come together and put our efforts together to help people who live on permafrost sort of prepare with the consequences of permafrost thawing under their roads and under their houses and in their backyards. So, uh, and this is, to be honest, this is where maybe the larger part of my work is, is on, in understanding how permafrost thawing changes the terrain, or changes the surface of the ground. Absolutely. Can I go back? Can I show you this slide with the ice in the- Absolutely. In the <laughs> and for those that are just joining us right now, we're having the opportunity to speak with Dr. Pascal Roy-Léveillé, a permafrost researcher, and she's telling a us a little bit more about the importance of why we need to pay attention to thawing permafrost and the researchers that are out there doing that. So this is your slide that you <laughs> would like to talk about. Yes, I, I wanted to. So I just explained that there's two key reasons why people, two key drivers of permafrost research. And the first one has to do mostly with carbon and how much carbon is in the ground. There's other issues tied to that, like contaminants sometimes that are attached to the carbon and, and, and come out. And then this here is another key aspect of permafrost research is because in our frozen ground in permafrost, we have a lot of ice. There's ice stored in there and there's often more ice trapped or stored in the permafrost than what the soil will be able to absorb as a sponge once it has thawed. So we have excess amounts of water stored in the form of ice. Sometimes it's little ice lenses like this, but sometimes it's bigger amounts of ice, like big wedges of ice in the ground, pure ice, layers of pure ice sometimes. But even where it's mostly soil, as you can see on the very left here, there's a core of permafrost that we extracted with, with a drill. 
And you can see that there's little bits of mud and in between the darker areas, that's like layers of ice that are in the ground. And when that kind of ground thaws, you can see here in a little beaker, a little glass beaker right beside it. If I take that sample and I just leave it to thaw in a beaker, then there's mud at the bottom, wet mud at the bottom and a whole bunch of excess water on top. So basically, this is another key problem with permafrost thawing. When it thaws, there's all this water that needs to go somewhere. The water, the ground becomes more muddy often because there's lots of ice in it, and the surface is going to subside down. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen all nicely and evenly everywhere. It happens in some places faster than in other places, and there's not the same amount of ice everywhere. So on the right-hand side here, you can see an example of a landscape where there's thawing happening and some of the ground surface is sinking down and some of the water is rising to the surface. Imagine if this is an area that used to be dry that you used to travel over, or, or heaven forbid, imagine you built a highway on there. <laughs> so Pascal, we have some good questions coming in uh, from our visitors. So, so thank you so much for those that are sending in your questions. We're absolutely looking forward to answering some of them. So don't be shy, send them in. If we can't answer everything on the air, Please don't worry, we're going to keep that chat running afterwards and we'll be able to provide some more additional information. But one of the questions that's coming in is about the soil itself. So as the permafrost is thawing and they're wondering whether or not, couldn't we plant more trees so that we can solidify the ground with that root system? Yeah. So. So there's actually, there's some areas that are forested where there is permafrost. So, you know, it's sometimes we think of permafrost as all tundra areas. There's a lot of tundra as we go further north, but in the southern parts of, of Canada, of the permafrost zones of Canada, we have a lot of areas that have forest on it. And um, trees don't like to grow everywhere, of course. So if it's very, <laughs> if it's very muddy and the area ends up underwater, like on that last image that I showed you, then, then the trees, and we see that sometimes, I didn't have, don't have a photo today, unfortunately, but you know, you'll have a, a shallow pond that has developed over a large area and there's a whole bunch of dead trees standing in it because it got too wet for them to be able to survive. But there's a lot of interesting interactions between vegetation and, and thawing ground. And it's actually one of the things that I'm interested in in my research. So in areas where we have bank erosion, like erosion of particularly lake banks is, is one thing that I'm, lake shores is one thing I'm interested in. When we have forests or very tall shrubs growing around the lake, you know, this erosion proceeds differently than when we have just tundra and, and really small vegetation all around the lake and, and it'll go at a different pace. The lakes will have a different shape, but it will also, um, have different impacts in terms of how easily the carbon can uh, rot once it falls in the water and emits greenhouse gases. So there's a lot to think about there on the vegetation, you know, the vegetation structure and the interactions with the ground. So, so that's, a, that's a great question and, and it's something that in a way, in some areas I'm working on, we are seeing more and more tall shrubs grow into the tundra and the vegetation changing as the top of permafrost thaws and that layer that thaws every summer becomes deeper. So taller plants can grow because there's more room to put roots. So their vegetation structure is changing in the north with all kinds of impacts coming with it, yeah. So I know you had mentioned earlier about working with the communities to, to help them with some of the, the infrastructure issues that they are, they're, they're experiencing. So road being collapsing or the, the house slumping. But if you're thinking about new projects or new development in uh, those communities right now, are you taking some or are researchers taking some of that knowledge and trying to preempt what could possibly happen? So some innovative technology. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if we want to go back to the slide decks, I can show you a couple of pictures to, to illustrate this as we as we talk about it. So slide number six. It's showing uh, some images of the kinds of impacts that permafrost degradation can have on infrastructure. So we talked about the ground losing volume or some areas becoming muddy. So, you know, you can see here a, a house that has sunk into the ground and 
here part of a road that has collapsed because of ice, a chunk of ice that was beneath the road that got eroded, probably partly due to water starting to run through the area under the road. And the bottom left photo shows a, a house that's a little bit like a snake over the landscape because some parts of it are settled and some parts are still up. And so in order to prevent those kinds of, of problems from happening, the people who build up north already have all kinds of strategies in place. So one of the first things that needs to happen is better understanding the conditions in an area through careful mapping of what kind of ground is underneath and how much ice there is. So I guess if we go to slide number seven quickly, then you can see, which is the next slide, then you can see those are photos of me working in the field. So you can see me drilling to extract some pieces of permafrost from the ground so that we can see how much ice is underneath in this area. So what's gonna happen if it starts to thaw? And then I work with some of my colleagues, particularly from Yukon College and use geophysics that allow us to see literally or to send wave or use electricity, different methods to see into the ground what's beneath the surface and then to start mapping, creating a map of an area that show us which are areas that are good to build on and which are areas that may be quite problematic when building on them. And then I think I have another slide, slide number nine. So slide number nine shows you some examples of technologies that are used in different places. Often when houses are built in areas that have permafrost, they're lifted up either on stilts, like you can see on the bottom right hand side, that's in, in Svalbard in Spitsbergen. In Canada and Northern communities, often we find our houses up on, on just stacks of blocks or, or sometimes sort of the, a metal space frame that just elevates the house above the ground so that the air can stay still below under the, under the house and keep the ground cold. Because if you put a house on top of the ground and you heat it, of course, you're... <laughs> You can play climate change all you want. If you just turn the house, you know, the heat up and you're right above the ground. It's so we have to be careful with how buildings are built. And sometimes, you know, you can see just um, in the top right image, there's a big white building, and there's a series of big pipes here that are used for just letting the wind blow underneath the building. So they extend under the building and come out on the other side. So this building is not elevated above the ground surface, but the wind can blow underneath it via a bunch of pipes in the winter. You know, the cold air, the cold air that's around the area tends to sink to the bottom anyways, and the warmer air tends to rise up. So you can use that principle to cool the ground beneath structures. This is so amazing. The now, top right photo is from Denmark. That's from Denmark, okay. So again, the impacts are Sorry, it's from the world. It's it's from Greenland, sorry. It's a it's an engineer from Denmark, Denmark who sent it to me, but it's it's actually okay. from Greenland. So from the top image from Greenland, but it is that proof of all the researchers working together for that common goal. Um Pascal, we have a question coming in from and, and I will apologize right now if I pronounce anybody's name wrong. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but I believe this one's coming in from Satu, age seven. And they're wondering a little bit more about the animals. Are animals being affected with permafrost thaws? Yeah, for sure animals are affected by permafrost thaws, by permafrost thaw, because the animals need certain kind of vegetation to find their food. They use certain kinds of areas to, to have their young, for example, for denning. So in different parts of the country, different animals are affected by permafrost thaw. In the Hudson's Bay lowlands, the polar bears like to use ground that's been rise, raised up a little bit by permafrost, so it's higher and a little bit drier than around it. They like to use those areas, but right now those areas are, are disappearing. Poor polar bears, they have it tough in every way with the sea ice disappearing and the permafrost on the land and they sure aren't getting a break lately. No, not at all. <laughs> but the, the caribou too, who you know feed on, on the lichen, for example, require a certain type of habitat. And if the ground becomes wetter, then it's not the right kind of place for them to find food. But then moose tend to move in when areas become wetter. And tall, if taller shrubs are growing, for example, in, in some places, the moose uh, tend to like that. So the animals are moving in different places. And I, I'm not a biologist. I'm, I'm really into the frozen mud, <laughs> but I really like to work 
with people from communities with traditional knowledge holders who've been, you know, are their families where there's been generations and generations and generations of hunters and trappers going on the land. And they know really well where animals like to be at different times of year and what kind of vegetation and, and conditions they need in order to thrive. So if I talk about this is how we foresee you know, the landscape changing because of permafrost thawing around here, then they can say, that'll be, you know, that'll be bad for caribou, but it may be good for moose. And then they can, we can come together and draw those connections. And my goal in those kinds of cases is, is to help the people in those communities adapt to how the terrain's gonna change and also to the changes in where the animals go, because a lot of people use animals as a traditional food source, especially up north. So, so it does change and it's a really important change for the people who live up north. Thank you. That's some great answers for, for in terms of that animal. And then we have another question coming in from Angel. So Angel is wondering about the, the thaw that we're seeing in the permafrost now and wondering if this is from things from our past and we're just starting to see it now. Of, um, what are the effects? Is it a long-term effects and we're just starting to see the thaw happening or is this something that's rapidly changing right now with what we're doing in our community. So I, I'm, I understand that it's about the pace at which permafrost is changing. The, the pace at which? So permafrost thaws in different ways. Often when we talk about permafrost thawing, we just imagine, you know, it just thaws, it's just thawing. But in fact, it's a little more complicated than that. And so there's parts of it that's happening very progressively, for example, just the, I told you there's, so there's permafrost and there's a layer that will thaw during the summer. So as things get warmer every summer, it thaws a little bit deeper. So some, in some parts of the country in particular, the permafrost developed when conditions were cooler. And I'm thinking like back thousands of years towards the end of the last glaciation. And the climate has been progressively warming since then. So in a lot of the country, uh, permafrost is sort of a heritage from the past how much ice is in it, how thick it is, that accumulated over years and years and thousands of years. So you can't just look at the temperature to date and guess what permafrost is like in an area. You have to look at what things were like in the past and it's constantly adapting to current conditions. So when it's thawing, you know, there's a, often there's peat, organic, like plant, dead plant and moss on the surface that kind of insulates the ground a little bit. So this progressive, you know, thawing of the top layer of permafrost a bit every summer happens maybe relatively slowly, okay. not uniformly year after year. Some years are warm, but then you'll get a couple cold years and it'll be warm again. So, but then there's sometimes it happens really catastrophically. And we've seen a lot more of that happening right now. So for example, you have, you know, a mountain or a bunch of hills where there's permafrost. And because we're getting some very warm summer, suddenly the ground thaws all the way to a really icy layer there. And everything that has thawed on top will just slide down the mountain. And then that layer is gone. So what was underneath is gonna start thawing. So you get some of those processes that will self-reinforce their positive feedbacks, if you will. The ground will rupture suddenly, a bunch of permafrost will be exposed in a bank or in a landslide or in a lake and then, or in a gully sometimes and it'll keep growing and growing and growing and growing and, and for a few years and then eventually, hopefully stabilize. So those processes, we call them thermal karst processes. They're happening quite catastrophically and it's difficult to recover, if you will. So, you know, just having one summer that has really warm and wet conditions can start a bunch of those features all over the place. And so with warming climate more recently, we have really seen an increase in the amount of those catastrophic, if you will, or really rapid degradation features starting, even in parts of the country that are very cold, like on Banks Island, they found a lot of like landslides happening because the conditions were right for a couple summers. And now you have all this frozen ground that used to be nicely insulated under the moss exposed to the air for the summer, right? And is there that anything sense? that we can do to help with some of the thawing or, any habits that we can get into or change that can do some type of a, an impact? 
it's a difficult question that one hey people often are like what can we do and and uh like you know controlling our our contributions to greenhouse warming of course is is uh probably the most important thing to do a lot of research is geared towards understanding what's happening and helping us prepare for it and then we have some engineering solutions that are small scale engineering solutions for specific roads and buildings and infrastructure. There is a paper that came out recently, however, so th there's a paper that came out recently that says that when we have large grazers in an area, then they can help to protect the permafrost because they'll chew on the vegetation and they can stop the shrubs for com from coming in, for example. And when the tall shrubs come in, they tend to trap a thick layer of snow on the ground. Whereas before in the tundra with just small plants, the snow was all getting blown off and the ground was exposed to the cold air and it would freeze really cold. So there's some research showing that the animals can actually help us, um, can, can actually help us protect permafrost or may actually be able to help us protect permafrost. This is research that has just come out, right? So I don't know to what scale, we would need this, but but I think it's one more argument towards really supporting the protection of, of for example, the caribou calving ground and, and being really careful with our development up north to make sure we don't interfere with those animals, which may actually be holding part of the solution to our problem. Although nothing will compensate for, for the amount of greenhouse gas <laughs> emissions that we're putting in the atmosphere right now. So that's an area where I think we can really, we can really help. The um, um, another question is coming in from Max, and he would like to know if there's uh, a lot of microbiologists that are involved in permafrost research. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, Max, there is. So um, I mentioned that one of the things, so my research has to do with the factors that uh, control how susceptible different areas are to thawing and what will happen when the ground thaws, will it recover well or not. So my research is sort of fundamental permafrost research. But I don't want to be lonely in the lab doing my fundamental work. I want to make sure people can use it. So I work with communities. I talked about that already. But I also work with hydrologists, with engineers, and with microbiologists, and with people who specialize in contaminants, so that they can use the, the improved understanding of permafrost that I produce. How does permafrost thaw? When? Uh, what facilitates or accelerates the thaw? Will it recover after? And then they can apply it in their different fields. So. I work a lot at Laurentian University with Dr. Nathan Basilico, who's a microbiologist, and he's interested in, in the biogeochemical cycles. So he's interested specifically in seeing what kind of microbial communities develop and thrive in areas where permafrost is thawing in different ways. And what does that mean for that plant material, you know, rotting or being decomposed and the kind of greenhouse gas emissions it will lead to. So, so there's a number of microbiologists and, and I collaborate with some of them. It's been super interesting. Now, Pascal, would you have anything or any special message that you want to leave us with in regards to permafrost and permafrost research? I think, you know, one of the things that's, one of the thing that's, that's important to me, I think, is that um, as Canadians, you know, we have a lot of permafrost in our country and we actually don't know it that well. We've put a lot of effort in some areas where there was more industrial development and infrastructure being built. And there's big parts of the permafrost in the country that we are just starting to study and, and don't know as well. And I, I think it's really, I think we have a responsibility towards, um, not just the people who live in these permafrost areas, but also the global community who's affected by the greenhouse gas emissions when permafrost is thawing. And I, I really think that Canada should be at the forefront of permafrost research. And so if there's people who are watching who are interested in permafrost research, you know, we have a small group of people who are doing permafrost work. And right now in the north of the country, a lot of people are facing the consequences of permafrost thaw for their communities. And I sometimes I feel like my phone keeps ringing and I'm not able to keep up. And I think we could really do it more permafrost researchers and, and cold region engineers and, and consultants specializing in permafrost. So 
So it's kind of a recruiting message, I guess. There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have a responsibility to lead internationally. We have a, per a responsibility to lead towards the communities who live in permafrost and to support them in their efforts to, to adapt and to mitigate those changes. And I think we need, we need people to join us and come and work with us. So come and learn about permafrost. <laughs> And being being a mother, so getting to know you a little bit more throughout uh, um, our journey together, um, being a mother is something you are absolutely passionate about, and I can see the joy when you speak about both your children. Uh, um, but what I was most struck with is that you are not scared to bring your little ones into the field with you to teach them about permafrost and the changes, and you're a real ambassador with your children. Uh, um, with this change? Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't want to make it seem like, um, I don't want to make it seem like it's easy. I think it's, <laughs> it's definitely full of challenges. I think there's one of the photos that is showing uh, me in the field with my youngest, Florence, so it's slide number uh, seven. And so, you know, th there's not many women in, in so there's women in, women in permafrost science often are working as consultants or they're working for government or they're working in, in jobs where it's still a bit easier maybe to be accommodated when you have a family and to take maternity leave and so on. In academia, we, in universities, we don't have it completely figured out. So it's still a bit of a challenge um, for women and for mothers who want to do research in fields where there's a lot of field work to be done. And um, I feel quite fortunate because the permafrost community is, has been tremendously supportive of, of me joining this field and developing my career in this field. So I feel very supported by my colleagues, a majority of, of male colleagues. And then, you know, I wanted to have children and, and make all of this work together, right? Which, which is difficult, yes. um, but I found ways and, and Florent came to the field and with me twice. So you can see a photo here in the top right corner where he was one years old and, and sort of looking at me installing temperature or helping me eh, install temperature sensors in the ground. He's got the, he's got my Letterman in his hands. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had him trained at a very young age to set, to set those temperature probes. I know, I wanna make sure he gets it right. He came to the field with me when he was, uh, he turned two months old in, in the field actually also. So, you know, now that he's a little bit older, three years old, I'm actually not able to bring him with me because he, it's become a little bit more difficult. But I think, um, I think for women who want to go to academia and want to have a family, the path is not all traced already for us. We kind of have to do some bushwhacking and make our own trail, but there are ways to make it work. And, and I think it's worth it. And I think, I think people are, in my field anyway, is very supportive, which, which really helps. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we have another question that came in. And I, I'm kind of chuckling to myself because you warned me on this one. Um, I got very excited when uh, I had mentioned to you that we're getting a, a real sample of permafrost sent to us. And <laughs> your first comment to me is like, "Ooh, you might want to make sure you have a really good container. And I'm going, oh, it doesn't smell so bad. <laughs> Until I actually got the real sample of permafrost. Oh boy. <laughs> How do you deal with that smell? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, so, you know, permafrost is different in different places. It can be sometimes just hard rock that's frozen. And then when it thaws, it's the same. It's now hard rock that's above zero Celsius degrees, <laughs> you know, and then nothing's happened. And you know, we don't study hard rock as much because we don't find it as interesting. Sometimes it's sand and sometimes it's silt, but sometimes there's a lot of that organic material that has started rotting, then got frozen in and now is gonna uh, rot some more and, and um, it can be quite smelly. But I find that it's, I find that it's not too bad. It happens once in a while where I'm, you know, close in a thermocarst feature where there's that catastrophic sort of thawing happening really fast. And sometimes you're like, whoa, you can really smell it here today. <laughs> But we're in the outdoors and, and it's windy because often we're in the tundra, so it's not so bad. One of the challenges when we're out in the field is, is the mosquitoes. And I, I, my last slide, slide number 10, has a, a photo of one of my colleagues, Louis Philippe, uh, when we were working in, in Oak Row Flats in northern Yukon. 
And so I would say that more than the oh my more, more than the smell of permafrost, what we have to worry about is the mosquitoes. I took that photo. I thought it was it was uh, it's funny too because usually we wear a bug jacket. But, uh, Louis Philip is really tough, so he didn't feel like he needed one. <laughs> but you yeah. know, there's, there's challenges with working in those remote areas, and the smell of permafrost is it comes once in a while, but it, I think it's not uh, it's not the biggest problem we have to deal with. Well, Pascal, for everything that you've shared with us today, your passion, again, has shone through with everything. Thank you for, for talking with us and talking with all of our audiences. Everybody, thank you for joining in and listening to the messages that Dr. Pascal Walibi had to share with us of, um, about permafrost, the thawing permafrost, and the importance of the research that is being done to learn more about the, the processes that are happening right now in our Canadian Arctic and across other areas of the world that have thawing permafrost. If you have any other questions that we were not able to address today, again, please send them in. It would be our pleasure to, to address those. And we do hope that everybody has a wonderful day. So thanks for tuning in to our Blue Coat Talks today. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, everyone.